Artem, of course, was angry at Xenia for leaving him there, but he decided to be patient. Await the end of the story, and then he'd give Xenia a piece of his mind. Suddenly, he was reminded of Hunter and his request. It was more like an order, really. But then, his thoughts went back to Xenia's story. Having returned with tea, he poured some into a tea glass, which had a rare metal outer casing. The kind they used to have in trains for tea, and he continued. So he went to sleep next to the fire, and there was silent all, silence all around. A heavy silence, as though his ears were full of cotton. And in the middle of the night, there's a strange sound. A totally sanity challenging and impossible sound. He was immediately covered in cold sweat and jumped right up. He heard children's laughter coming from the tunnel. This is four stations from the nearest people. Rats don't even live there. Can you imagine? There was reason to be alarmed, so he jumped up and runs under the arches to the tunnel, and he sees there's a train coming into the station, a real train. It's heading, its headlights are shining and blinding him. The wanderer could have been blinded by, by them, so it's good he covered his eyes with his hand in time. The windows were lit in yellow, and there were people inside, and this was all going on in total silence, not a sound. There wasn't a hum from the engine, not a clatter of wheels. The train glides into the station in total silence, you see. The guy sits down, something's wrong with his heart, and there's people in the train's windows, like real people who have, who are chatting away inaudibly. The train, wagon by wagon, is going past him, and he sees in the last window of the last wagon, there's a seven-year-old child looking at him, looking at him, pointing at him, and laughing. And the laughter was audible. There was such silence that the guy could hear his own heart beating along with the child's laughter. The train dives into the tunnel and the laughter gets quieter and quieter and goes silent in the distance. And again, emptiness and an absolute horrifying silence. And then he woke up. Artyom asked maliciously, but with a certain hope in his voice. If only, he rushed back towards the extinguished fire, quickly gathered up his belongings and ran back to Tolskaya without stopping. He ran the whole way in one hour. It was so scary. You have, have to think. Artyom had gone quiet, frozen by what he'd heard. Silence descended in the tent. Finally, having gathered his wits and coughed, making sure that his voice wouldn't give him away and crack, Artyom asked Zinya as indifferently as he could. And what? You believe all that? Well, it's not the first time I heard this kind of story about the Serpovskaya Serp Serp line, Zinya replied. Only, I don't always tell you them. It's not, not possible to talk about these things with you in a normal way. You start interrupting straight away. Okay, we've sat here for a while, you and me, and it's almost time to go to work. Let's get ready. We can talk more when we get there. Artyom got up reluct reluctantly, dragged himself home. He needed to get a snack to take to work. His stepfather was still sleeping. It was totally quiet at the station. Most people had probably been let off work and there was a little time left until the night shift began. He should hurry up. 
For he passed the guest tent in which Hunter was staying, Artyom saw that the tent flaps were pulled aside and the tent was empty. His heart skipped a beat. Finally, he understood that everything he discussed with Hunter hadn't been a dream, that it had actually taken place, and that the development of the events could have a direct impact on him. He knew what fate lay before him. The tea factory was located in a dead end at a blocked exit from the underground where there were escalators leading upwards. All of the work in the factory was done by hand. It was too extravagant. It was too extravagant to waste precious electric energy on production. Behind the iron screens that separated the territory of the factory from the rest of the station, there was a metal wire drawn from wall to wall on which clean cleaned mushrooms were dying, or drying. When it was particularly humid, they would, they made little fires underneath the mushrooms so that they would dry more quickly and wouldn't get covered with mold. Under the wire, there was tables where the workers first cut and then crushed the dried mushrooms. The prepared tea was packed into paper or polyethylene packages, depending on what was available at the station, and they added some extracts and powders to it, the recipe of which was only known to the head of the factory. That was the straightforward process of producing tea, without the much needed conversation while you worked your eight hour shifts of cutting and crushing mushroom caps, then it would probably be the most exhausting business. Artyom worked this shift with Zanya and a new shaggy haired guy called Kirill, with whom he'd been on patrol too. Kirill became very animated at the sight of Zanya. Obviously, they had met and spoken before. He quickly took to telling him some story that had apparently been inter interrupted. That had been interrupted the last time they spoke. Artyom sat in the middle and wasn't interested enough to listen, so he, pl he plunged into his thoughts. The story about Serpukovskaya. Scalia line that Zinya had just told him had started to fade in his memory, and his conversation with Hunter surfaced. What could he, what could be done? The orders given to him by Hunter were too serious not to think of them over. What if Hunter would not be able to do whatever it was he was intended? He had com he had committed to a completely senseless act, having dared to venture into the enemy's lair right into the heat of the fire. The danger he was subjecting himself to was enormous, and he himself didn't even know its true perimeters. He could only guess at what awaits him at the fifth or at the five hundredth meter, where the light of the last fire at the border post grew dim. The last man-made flames to the north of VDNKH. All he knew about the Dark Ones was that everyone, what everyone else knew. But no one else was thinking of going out there. In fact, it wasn't even a known fact that there was a real passageway at the botanical gardens where beasts could enter the metro from above. The likelihood was too great that Hunter wouldn't be able to complete the mission he'd, he'd taken upon himself. Obviously, the danger from the north seemed to be so great and was increasing so quickly that any Delay was impossible, or inadmissible. 
Hunter probably knew something about its nature, and he hadn't revealed in his meeting with Sequoia or his conversation with Hardium. Therefore, he probably was aware of the degree of the risk and understood that he would probably not be up to his task. Otherwise, why would he prepare Artyom for a turn of events? Hunter didn't resemble an overcautious person, so that meant that the probability that he wouldn't return to VDNKH existed and was rather significant. But how could Artyom give up everything and leave the station without saying anything to anyone? Hunter himself was afraid of warning anyone else, afraid of the worm-eaten brains here. How would it be possible to get to Polis, to the legendary Polis all alone, though all the evident and mysterious dangers that awaited travelers in the dark and mute tunnels? But through all the evident and mysterious dangers that awaited travelers in the dark and mute tunnels. Artyom suddenly regretted that he had succumbed to Hunter's strong charms and hypnotizing gaze, that he had told him his secret and agreed to such a dangerous mission. Hey Artyom, Artyom, you sleeping there or what? Why aren't you saying anything? Zinya shook his shoulder. Did you hear what Kirill was saying? Tomorrow night, they're organizing a caravan to Riskaya. They say that our administration has decided to make a pact with them. But meanwhile, it looks like we're sending them humanitarian aid with a view to becoming brothers. Seems they have found some kind of a warehouse containing cables. The leaders want to lay them down. They say they're going to make a telephone system between the stations. In any case, a telegraph system. Kirill says that whoever isn't working tomorrow can go. Want to? Artyom thought right there and then that fate itself was going, giving him an opportunity to fulfill his mission. If it came to that, he nodded silently. Great, Zinya was great. Zinya was glad. I'll also go, Kirill. Sign us up, okay? What time are you going to set off tomorrow? At nine? Until the end of the shift, Artyom didn't say a word. He wasn't in the mood to extract himself from his distracting, gloomy, gloomy thoughts. Zenya was left to deal with the disheveled Kirill by himself, and he obviously felt hurt. Artyom continued to chop mushrooms with mechanical movements and to crumble them into dust taking the little caps down from the wire and again chopping them and so on indefinitely. Hunter's face hovered in front of his eyes, frozen at the moment when he was saying that he might not make it back. The calm face of a person who is used to risking his life and an ink stain marred his heart with the present presentiment of trouble. After work, Artyom went back to his tent. His stepfather wasn't there anymore. He had clearly gone out to take care of business. Artyom fell onto the bed and buried his face in the pillow and went to sleep straight away. Even though he had planned to think over his situation again in the peace and quiet. His sleep was delirious after all the conversations, thoughts, and worries of the preceding day and it en enveloped him and carried him away into the abyss. Artyom saw himself sitting next to the fire at the Sek Sekarovskaya station next to Zinya and, wa and the wandering magician with the unusual Spanish name of Carlos. 
Carlos is teaching Xenia how to make weed out of mushrooms and he is explaining that you have to use it just like you use it at VDNKH. A clean crime because these mushrooms aren't mushrooms at all but a new type of rational life on earth which may, with time, replace humans. That these mushrooms aren't independent beings, but just elements connected by, a, by neurons to the whole unit, spread across a whole metro of a gigantic fungus. And that, in reality, the person who consumes the weed isn't just using a psychotropic material, but is making contact with this new form of rational life. And if you do it right, then you can make friends with it. And then it will help the person that makes contact with it through the weed. But then Sequoi appears, and no, appears threatening Artyom with his forefinger. He says that you obviously mustn't take weed because if you use it for an extended amount of time, then your brain becomes worm-eaten. But Artyom decides to test it and see if it's really true. And he tells everyone that he's going to go, he's going to get some air, but he carefully goes behind the back of the magician with the Spanish name and he sees that, that the magician doesn't have a back to his head, but his brains are visible, full of wormholes. Long whitish worms curling in circles are chewing into the fabric of his brain and are making new tunnels, and the magician just carries on talking as though nothing is happening. Then Artyom gets scared and decides to run away from him. He begins to tug at Xenia's sleeve so that he would come with him, but Xenia just waves him away and asks Carlos to go on. And Artyom sees that the worms are crawling down from the magician's head and towards Xenia, and crawling up Xenia's back. They are trying to get into his ears. Then Artyom jumps up and takes to his heels and runs from the station with all of his might, but then remembers that this was the tunnel you're not supposed to go through alone, and only in groups, so he turns around and runs back to the station, but for some reason he can't get to it. Behind him, suddenly, there is a light and a clarity and logic that is unusual for dreams. Artyom sees his own shadow on the floor of the tunnel. He turns around and from the bowels of the metro a train is heading towards him without stopping, gnashing and rattling its wheels with deafening sound and blinding him with its headlights. And his legs refuse to budge. They've lost all power, and they aren't even legs anymore, but empty trousers stuffed with rags. And when the train has almost reached Artyom, the visions suddenly lose their color and disappear. Instead, something new appears, something totally different. Artyom sees Hunter dressed in snow white in an unfurnished room with blindingly white walls. He stands there, his head hanging down, his gaze drilling into the floor. Then he rises his eyes and looks straight at Artyom. The feeling is very strange because of this dream, Artyom can't feel his own body. But it is as if he is looking at what is going on from all ang angles at once. When Artyom looks into Hunter's eyes, he is filled with an incomprehensible uneasiness as expectation of something very significant, something that might happen any second. Hunter starts talking to him and Artyom has the feeling that what 
has just happened was real. When he'd had nightmares before, he had told himself simply that he was sleeping and that everything that was happening was only the fruit of an excited imagination. But in this vision, the knowledge that he could wake up at any moment if he wanted was totally absent. Trying to meet Artyom's gaze, even though he had that the impression that Hunter couldn't actually see him and was blindly undertaking his task, the hunter slowly and gravely says, The time has come. You have to do what you promised me. You have to do it. Remember, this is not a dream. This is not a dream. Artyom opens, opened his eyes wide and again in his head, he heard with horrifying clarity the gruff voice saying, This is not a dream. This is not a dream, Artyom repeated. The details of the nightmare about the worms and the train were quickly wiped from his memory, but Artyom could remember the second vision perfectly in all its detail. Hunter's strange clothes and mysterious empty white room in the words, You have to do what you promised me. He couldn't get them out of his mind. His stepfather came in and worried, asked Artyom, Tell me, did you see Hunter after our meeting together? It's becoming evening already and he's gone missing and his tent is empty. Did he leave? Did he tell you anything yesterday about his plans? No, Uncle Sasha. He was just asking, asking about the condition at the station and what was going on. Artyom lied conscientiously. I'm afraid for him that he's done something silly at his own expense and to our general harm. Sequoi was clearly upset. He doesn't know who he's been dealing with. Eh, uh, what? You're not working today? Me and Zenya signed up to join the caravan to Reshkaya today to help them get across, and we'll start unwinding the cable from there. Artyom replied, suddenly realizing that he had just decided to go. At that thought, something broke inside him. He felt a strange lightning and also some kind of inner emptiness. Like someone had taken a tumor out of his chest, which had been bur burdening his heart and interfering with his breathing. The caravan? You'd do better to sit at home instead of wading through tunnels. I need to go there anyway, to Riskaya but I'm not feeling all that great today. Another time, maybe. Are you going out now at nine? Well, then we'll get to say goodbye then. Get your things together in the meantime. And he left Artyom alone. Artyom started to throw things into a rucksack. Things which might be useful on the road. A small lamp, batteries, mushrooms, a package of tea, and liver, and pork sausage. A full machine gun clip, which he once filched from someone. A map of the metro, and more batteries. He needed to remember to bring his passport. It, it would be of no use in, at Riskaya, of course, but beyond the station he'd be detained or put against the wall by the very first patrol of another sovereign station, depending on their politics. There was the capsule given to him by Hunter, and that was all he needed. He threw the rucksack on his back, and Artyom looked back for the last time at his home and walked out of the tent with resolve. The group that was going with the caravan had gathered at the platform. 
at the entrance to the southern tunnel. On their rails there was a cart loaded with boxes of meat, mushrooms, and packages of tea. On top of them there was some kind of cle cleaver device put together by local experts, probably some kind of telegraph apparatus. In the caravan, part of Kirill, no, in the caravan, apart from Kirill, there was another pair, a volunteer and a commander with the administration who would establish relations and come to an agreement with the administration at Rizhskaya. They had already packed and were playing dominoes while waiting for the departure signal. The machine guns were, that were assigned to them for the journey were piled beside them. They formed a pyramid and the barrels directed upwards and their spare clips attached to their bases with blue insulation tape. Finally, Xenia appeared. He'd been, no, he'd had to feed his sister and send her to the neighbors before he left since his parents were still at work. At the very last second, Artyom suddenly remembered that he, had said, he hadn't said goodbye to his stepfather, excusing himself and promising that he would be right back. He threw off his rucksack and ran home. There was no one in the tent. Artyom ran into the quarters where service personnel often hung around, but it now belonged to the station's administration. Sequoia was there. He was sitting opposite the duty officer of the station, the elected head of VDNKH, and they were talking about something animated, animatedly. And they were talking about something animatedly. Artyom knocked on the door jam and quietly coughed. Greetings, Alexander Nikolovich. Nikolovich, could I speak to Uncle Sasha for a minute? Of course, Artyom, come in. Want some tea? The duty officer said hospita hospitably. You off already? When are you going coming back? Sukhoi asked while pushing his chair back from the table. I don't know exactly, Artyom mumbled. We'll see how it goes, and he understood that he might never see his stepfather again, and he really didn't want to lie to him. The man, the one man who truly loved Artyom and say that he would be back tomorrow or the day after, and everything would continue as it was. Artyom suddenly felt a sting in his eyes, and to his shame, he found that they were wet. He stepped forward and hugged his stepfather. Now, now, Artyom, what's the matter? You'll be back tomorrow after all. Well, his surprising, it, no, his surprised stepfather said reassuringly, Tomorrow might, or tomorrow night, if everything goes to plan, Alexander Nikolovich confirmed. Take care of yourself, Uncle Sasha. Good luck, Artyom uttered hoarsely, shaking his stepfather's hand, and quickly left. Sequoia watched him leave in surprise. Why is he come? Um, why is he come unglued? It's not the first time he's been to Riskaya. Nothing, Sasha. Nothing. There will be a time when your boy will grow up. Then you'll be nostalgic for the days when he said goodbye to you with tears in his eyes, when he was just going two stations away. So what were you saying about the opinion of Alex Segskoya about the patrolling of tunnels? It would be very handy for us. When Artyom ran back to the group, the commander had given each person a machine gun and said, So then, men, shall we sit down for a moment before we go? And he sat down on the old wooden bench. 
The rest of them followed his example silently. Okay, God be with us. The commander stood up and jumped down onto the path, taking his place at the front of the group. Artyom and Zanya, as the youngest members of the group, climbed up onto the cart and prepared themselves for hard work. Kirill and the second volunteer took their places behind, completing the chain. Let's go, shouted the commander. Artyom and Zinya leaned on the levers and Kirill pushed the cart from behind and it squeaked, shunting forward, and then started gliding ahead. The last two guys walked behind it, and the group disappeared into the muzzle of the southern 